Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. First time of the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. I had a chance to look at them. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I do have some comments to make and uh, clarifications, corrections, additions that I would okay. like to address. Um, item number six mm -hmm. on the minutes. Uh, states that I stated a concern about making a change on the January meeting. I feel that underrepresents what I stated. I actually referenced statute, local government code, section 143.006, subsection E. I distributed copies of said section. I read it and noted that the language shall have the mandatory or shall have the January meeting was mandatory and did not allow for us to unilaterally exercise flexibility to uh, change that. So I ask that that sentence be altered to reflect that I referenced that specific statute, distributed it to the commission and to our record keeper and mentioned the mandatory language therein. The next area, and I have two clarifications that need to be made to Teresa, section eight. I don't know. It is it, there's a green light, so. Yeah, there you go. There. Uh, section eight about a mm, little more than halfway, but not quite two thirds down that page. Um, when I was talking about the commission's authority, mm -hmm. I mentioned three areas of authority. We have authority over rules, appeals over examination questions, and over disciplinary suspensions. I'm positive I talked about that because I talked about the law having been amended in either late 80s, or early mid 90s to allow for arbitration and mentioned that since that amendment to the law, there had been very few, if any, disciplinary matters brought to this commission or any commission in the state, but that the law has not changed. That's still an option. That used to be what our commission spent the majority of its time on, was we had disciplinary hearings that could take days. So I know I mentioned it, and I've asked that that be added in, even though it's not something we have dealt with in quite a while. The next change that I would like made is further down that page, uh, there is statement that I was unsure about something until I was able to look at the local rules. That's not, I, I may have said 143, I was referring to the statute, not the local rules. So I have asked, or will ask that that be changed to statute. I think we had the rules in hand at that point, but did not have the statute, because actually Ms. James offered to bring her local government code over to me. <laughs> So in any event, with those three noted changes and asking that the copy that I distributed of 143.006 subsection E be made an exhibit as an attachment to the minutes, I would move approval with those changes. Questions? No. no questions. Okay. Your mic's off, Christine. Okay. Moving on to the uh, daily action log. Hopefully, we had a chance to look at that. <clears throat> Question for staff on the 316 2022 entry. The promotion mentioned, those are the automatic promotions of probationary officers to full-fledged police officers, is that correct? That's correct. The only other thing to add that is not um, on the, the uh, daily action log, simply because of our payroll cycle, is there was a temporary 
assignment of um, Corey Sanders to the assistant chief position in fire um, as of April 1st. That'll be on the next log. Um, like I said, it's just in the process of being approved because of payroll purposes. Okay. And is the police officer who was serving and temporary, was it lieutenant status? as of last meeting is that still in place he's not he's no longer temporary he's been back moved back down to his original okay. uh, positions so. I would maybe request that that be since the temporary designation had been noted in the daily action log I'd ask that that be added to the daily action log as well so that the records complete just for any clarifications yes okay. and with those questions answered and that clarification made and what Veronica told us regarding Corey Sanders, I'd move approval of the daily action log. My second. I don't have any, I don't have any questions. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to the discussion of uh, local government code 143, section 143.030. Eligibility for the fire department promotional examinations, and we're looking also at filling vacancies. Okay, so I do have this on the PowerPoint section. I'm sorry, um, item three through seven will be on the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so discussion of local government code 143 section 143030, eligibility for fire department promotional examination, subsection B and C and consideration of revising applicable civil service rules and regulations, section 46, promotions, filling vacancies, subsection B6, to clarify testing eligibility when a classification has both attested and appointed position. I will tell you that the, the section quoted in here in the local government code is not the correct section. It's actually section 143.028 as it applies to section 46 of the civil service rules, the local rules. Um, but it is section 46 in the local rules um, that, that we'll be discussing. So currently section 46 of the local rules indicates that no firefighter shall be eligible for promotion unless he has served in that department for at least two years at any time prior to the day of such promotional examination in the next lower position or other positions specified by the commission and no person with less than four years actual service in such department shall be eligible for promotion to the rank of cap captain or its equivalent. So in this instance, I had the uh, current uh, assistant fire chief that's in an appointed position apply for the tested position. I did deny his application because he's in that position. Um, based on this rule though, and assuming that the commission indicates that this is considered one of the other positions specified by you, it would qualify and allow him to sit for this examination. So if that is the, um, the desire of the commission as one of the positions that contest, then I would, um, I do have some recommended language to add to this section. And it would only apply to, in this case, this classification because we have an appointed position and a tested position. Question. So we just, we just add A to it underneath the... Yes, if, the if that's the case, I, I would recommend adding specific language under this section as A, if a tested position, if, if a tested and appointed position exist within the same classifica classification, an incumbent of the appointed position may apply to sit for the tested promotional examination. I have a question, but it's really more for my curiosity than anything. Um, is there an advantage to testing for a position that you're already serving in? The advantage would be, and I can let the, the chief speak to that, the advantage would be in the specific duties that that position does. 
Well, I think the biggest advantage would actually be, um, so in the appointed position, if you did get a new fire chief that came in, mm -hmm. that appointed position could be demoted at any point. Okay. Gotcha. So in the tested yeah. position, basically that appointed assistant chief would secure his position yeah. in the event that there was a change of leadership within the department. Makes sense. That's correct. Okay. okay. I, don't, I don't have any problem with it. Okay, I've got some questions. Uh, the only classification to which this would apply is assistant chief in both fire and police departments, right? That's the only classification where we have appointed? Only the fire department. Only fire. Both of your assistants are tested now? Appointed. Appointed, okay, that's right. Is there a good reason to not just go ahead and specify the tested and appointed uh, position or just in the fire department? Assistant chief, and if the circumstances, law, whatever, subsequently changes, then that would give us the opportunity as a commission to Amen. discuss whether we wanted that to apply to whatever other classification rank um, the law might allow. I, I can't imagine that happening, but... Well, it would, it would happen during a meet and confer process. That's how a lot of departments get additional appointed chiefs, or they can essentially create a new position and go outside 143. So that would be the context in which something might change. Well, so but FIRE has never had meet and confer, and they have it. So I think that was allowed by the legislature. So the legislature could also create they a situation. They could also, yes, ma'am. Yeah. But So that that's my thinking. Okay. If, it, if it happens to meet and confer, the commission has no role. But Fire has never meet and conferred, so. But if it happens during meet and confer, we would still have to come back and change the rule. I um, mean, essentially, the meet and confer process allows you to go outside of the 143 rules. And so if we're going to create yes, a rule does. that's very specific to what 143 says now, if there is a meet and confer process, either in police or if fire decides to become meet and confer, I know that's been discussed a couple of times since I've been here that there's the potential. So my preference is to leave it as open-ended as possible with everybody understanding right now it only applies to one position. Mm. Well, <clears throat> perhaps the meet and confer statute has changed, but when I worked on the first agreement and the two amendments that occurred, or the two new agreements, you didn't have to go back to the commission. If the meet and confer agreement changed the rule, the meet and confer agreement changed the rule. and. You could make reference to that in your civil service rules, but as long as a meet and confer agreement was approved, ratified, um, that's what governed. Uh, I still think that if something changes that would lead us to have a situation where this rule would apply to other than assistant chief and fire, um, I think we need to look at it. Um, what is it about the current rule that made this particular candidate ineligible? Was he not in the position two years prior to the exam? I think in this particular instance, it was the context in which the question was asked. It goes back to that whole issue of just filling a seat in order to get an exam to take because somebody had been quarantined due to COVID. So we really didn't consider this too strongly because of the other issue. But then we wanted to make sure that if it came up again, it was clear what that the assistant fire chief who's appointed would have the opportunity to um, test. But you're right. I mean, I think that there's enough language in there that it can certainly be stated that he could be allowed to test just on the way the rule is written. But to make it, for clarity's sake, we want to make an amendment to make sure it's understood by everybody in the future. 
One thing that's not really noted up there is, so currently our assistant chief, the appointed assistant chief, spent two years as the rank immediately below assistant chief as a battalion chief. Yeah. But there are occasions, which have happened in the past, where a sitting appointed assistant chief did not serve as a battalion chief to the next lower mm -hmm. rank. Mm -hmm. So therefore, this rule would not apply to that person because he didn't hold mm -hmm. the rank below the previous two years or two years any time prior. Right. right. You don't have to take your appointed chief from the immediate below rank. You can take your appointed assistant chief from where so you feel the that's candidate. That's kind of what made Chief Fisher eligible because he did sit in that battalion chief rank for two years. I guess I would state my recommendation would be to add to the existing section 46 subsection B6, the clarifying sentence that at the fire department assistant chief classification if an appointed assistant wishes to test for the appointed position, he or she may do so. They would be testing for the tested position, not the appointed position. So I think I kind of said that, but I didn't say tested, but, but te made, I, yes. I said may test so for the can, position, so the if it's position. appointed, there is no test for it, so right. therefore I think it's pretty clear I meant the tested, but yes. Okay, so uh, would it, would you want me to add to what's recommended? Um, if a tested and appointed um. No, I think uh, what I'm recommending is that a sentence be added after the sentence that ends shall be eligible for motion, uh, promotion to the rank of captain or its equivalent. Okay. And... Again, having just gotten this right before the meeting started, um, I don't. I wasn't able to write as I was making my recommendation. But what I said was in the or something very close to this. In the case of assistant chief in the fire department. If an appointed assistant chief wishes to undertake the promotional exam for the appointed assistant chief position, he or she may do so. That way we're clarifying that as part of that rule. I just have a, sure. could it, you know, when we, when we were looking at this, I mean, it really already says that in there. Uh, no firefighter, uh, no firefighter shall be eligible for promotion unless he served in the department for at least two years at any time. It's already in there. So, I mean, the, the, the level, I, I, I see what you're saying, but it's, could you just say a sentence that say the assistant chief of the fire department is not exempt from this rule and just be done with it? That's just uh, a, I guess that's what you know. That was that was my very first question. Right. It's like, what about this rule yeah, we don't, kept this person right. from being able to do it? And it was right. explained it had something to do with right. uh, needing enough people to test. Right. So I mean, they brought it to us apparently thinking there needs to be an amendment, a clarification, something. I mean, and I suppose you could have an appointed assistant chief who hadn't been there for two years. Right. That's correct. Right. But, it, but then it wouldn't, he wouldn't who at any time held the position underneath, so it wouldn't, he wouldn't qualify anyway. Yeah. So, well, but, I mean, but under this amendment, he but, 
Yeah. So you're saying you're going to allow a captain that's a tested... I'm not allowing anything. <laughs> well, okay. I, guess that's, I guess that's what I'm saying is, is so uh, in the instance where Chief Brody was talking about that a captain who is now the assistant chief who has never held battalion chief was directly below assistant chief to just sit for the test itself. Well, I mean, that's, that's what the amendment that was brought to us yes. would do. Gotcha. And so my recommendation was consistent with that amendment, although more specifically tied to assistant fire chief. Gotcha. Now, if you're asking each member of this commission, do we think that's a good idea? I guess both. That's another question. Right. Okay. Um, so you've posed the question, and Mr. Chairman, do you think we should address that question? <laughs> Well, and I think it's also the question, if they were a battalion chief for only a year, then they don't meet that first rule, but we would allow them to test if they've been an assistant chief for that year. So we are granting them additional ability to test. Well, and, and one more thing, if a captain, uh, a, a captain who is never, was never a battalion chief mm -hmm. is made the appointed position, mm -hmm. I don't think they should, this is my opinion, I don't think they should have the right to sit for the tested spot as though, because they, they were put there appointed by the fire chief. They did not earn a position of battalion chief, and then, they, they, I mean, if, if the fire chief could walk in and pick a hoseman, a hoseman to be the assistant chief, right? I, I'm just saying, if, if that's being appointed, they should not have the right to sit for the tested position. If, if, if someone has achieved the highest position as a battalion chief, which is the position right underneath um, the position we're testing for, mm -hmm. then they should have every right just through civil service to sit for that exam. Okay, so Mason, if the appointed chief has served as appointed chief for two years or more, it's okay with you no, that they if test? No, they if, they, if the appointed chief was a battalion chief when they were appointed. Okay, no. so, so... So if you left the rule just the way it was and I was a captain and, the tested, and I want to sit for the tested assistant chief position, I could not because I have not at two years, at in, two for two years at any time, prior to the day of the test, held the position directly below right. assistant chief, which is battalion chief. So I would never even be able to sit. Okay, so it doesn't matter how long That's, you've been the appointed chief. No. Under no. Mason's rule. There Under. are instances where those lower ranks can test. Yes. If there's not enough in the yeah. battalion chief yeah. level, then the lower right. ranks. So yeah. it's not a case where you never get to test. Right, yeah, we and, and amended I, the rule to allow that. And that's yes. the only reason I was bringing this up, is if you left it the way that it was and it was interpreted the way that it was, it would take care of all of that and you wouldn't even have to we wouldn't have to worry about a captain wanting to sit for that exam because he wouldn't even meet the rule at all. It would never even, you wouldn't even have to, if you add that, if a tested appointed position, now you could have a captain wanting to sit for it and qualifying for it down here, but not qualifying for it in the previous state. Well, unless you put something in there about if the incumbent assistant chief meets rule six, meaning that he held the lower rank at some point. No. And again, I, the only reason I was bringing it up is if, it, if, it's, if you keep it the way that it is, and, and you have, and I'm just going to use for names so we can keep it all straight, uh, Chief Fisher was a battalion chief for four years, three years. So he was made the appointed chief. This opened up. He held at any time the position of battalion chief, which is directly below assistant chief, for at least two years, he would be eligible to sit. He if, certainly if, been with the department for more right, than four. Right, so if a, if a, if a captain, uh, and um, I'll just use a previous, uh, uh, Chief Sanford was, was our previous assistant chief. He had been a captain for, say, eight years. He would never be able to sit for the tested position because he's never held the position right below assistant chief at any time. So I guess that's what I'm trying to think is, it, does it even need to be changed? Because as long as it's read the way that it is, it should always be applicable. I guess, or, or correct. I just, I guess that's, that was, uh, you yeah. So, I mean, the, the commission does have the ability to not amend it at all. I, in, in my mind, it's not particularly clear, um, but, but it's clear I mean, to, it's, uh, the people that are going to be testing and Moving up, right? It's clear to you all how it speaks. So do we need to change it? 
do you? I don't know that we need to change it simply because the whole reason why he wasn't allowed to test had nothing to do with time and grade or the appointment or anything. It was simply a COVID miscue, mm -hmm. which we've mm -hmm. already addressed right. elsewhere. So I think we're kind of creating work here. That's just my thought. I tend to and, I, agree. and that's no offense to y'all. I mean, oh, I oh no, no, we don't take offense. We have very thick skin. I, I always think the simpler, the better, uh, whenever possible. Simpler the wording, the better, as long as it addresses the issue, which I think the original uh, six does, as you pointed out. <clears throat> well, it addresses the issue that Mason raised, but I'm not sure it addresses the issue that Chief Brody raised. That if you've been promoted into an assistant chief position from a captain you will never have the opportunity to test for assistant chief testing Unless position. they Unless open it up to captains because yes. we don't have enough don't have battalions right. that and, chief sitting. And, and again, this is just my, why we, I, we wouldn't want the captain to sit. He has never, he, the fire chief made a, picked him for a reason, especially, and that's why we have a tested position and why we have an appointed position right. is one follows all the rank structure all the way up and one does not. You, you wouldn't just, you know, adopt, say that, oh, well, they've been a captain, but they've been the assistant chief for a while, so we'll just let them sit for the, they haven't earned the right to sit for assistant chief test because they've never achieved battalion chief. They never held the rank at any time prior. Okay, you don't think any amount of experience as an assistant chief? I, I think that, but I also, th I think you achieve that by having an appointed position and a tested position. And what I mean by that is one follows our rank structure all the way up and, and you, you sit for each test. Okay. Okay. And then on the other side, you know, if, if, if we have a driver, that a 30-year driver who who's never even achieved officer, but but the fire chief thinks that they will will check, you know, do do a wonderful job in administration, then I think that he should be appointed. But I do not think that it auto Without automatically makes him captain, et cetera. Okay. That he's, I, I'll say, earned the ride. He is not promoted throughout through the system to be able to sit for the tested position. And, and I want to go on record and say, not that this would ever happen, particularly in our, in our department, but I could see where this could conceivably be abused, mm -hmm. you know, it could. through favoritism. It where, could. And I would hate to see that as a possibility. Well, and, and inversely, you know, that the, the, at any time, um, and where, where we talked about that, do our member or do, you know, do we see it as that way? Absolutely. Uh, there, you know, if I'm, if I'm a lieutenant and I, let's say I were to get reprimanded and, and be demoted, and I've been a lieutenant for four years, and I get promoted back to driver, and now there's a captain's test. Uh -huh. I, I've held the position below captain for four years, and I could still test. That's already happened. We've already done that several mm -hmm. times. So the precedent's already been set. That it doesn't, doesn't mean you have to be holding the spot. Right now. Right now. It just means that at any time, I mean, if it's just read as literal as it is, I don't even think yeah. anything needs to be changed. But, uh, yeah. And again, as, as I always say, you know, my experience, largely comes from military service, and I can give you an example of how this has been abused in the military. You have someone that needs to make senior NCO, and they've tested, and they tested, mm -hmm. and they tested, and they can't do it, and they're up against what we call a high year of tenure, where they're gonna be forced out. Mm -hmm. I've seen commanders who have the authority to promote somebody to senior NCO one time a year. I've seen them pick that person just to keep them in mm -hmm. over somebody who is much more deserving. Um, it's happened to me where I've been bypassed and I've seen that that person that they promoted never be able to perform at senior NCO level. That's why they put the test there. Uh, but that slot may have taken up the slot that I legitimately promote, would have promoted into. Right. Cause there's, you know, we only have four slots. I'm taking yours and I'm giving it to his. That's him, and that's exactly what happens. And I, I don't want to see that happen. And, and you could. I mean, like you said, I, th I do think it could be abused. If, if, and I'm, again, just for namesakes, I'll use Chief Brody. So Chief Brody, you know, we let's say we've got a three-year hoseman, right? And Chief Brody, Chief Brody thinks this guy's great. He puts him into that position, into the appointed assistant chief position. He sits there for five, six years, and then he, now he tests new fire chiefs coming in. That guy who is only a hoseman sits for the attested spot just because he has the experience i just i could see that could be that, that i think that like defeats the whole purpose of civil service to me uh, but um you know i like you know we kind of all understand that you can either you know you work up to a position and you could be appointed or you work up and you test all the way until you achieve assistant chief mm -hmm. and this in this instance you know as we look at this and as we just switched fire chiefs 
you know, the thought came up, you know, he, um, uh, Chief Fisher was not allowed to sit for this exam, so the thought came up, well, what happens when Chief Brody leaves? What if, what if Chief Fisher's still sitting there and the new chief walks in and goes, you know, I don't like you very much, you're going back to the floor. I think he should have the ability to sit for the test of position because at that point he does have the experience. Because he meets the criteria. Right. So yeah. that, that's the only reason I, think that, I guess we had a concern about it was, yeah. was in one. And I think that's what it boils down to is, again, as Six says, do they meet the criteria to right. start with? Yeah. And, and again, there are the exceptions. You know, I think we changed the minimum for, to three instead of four. Well, that's what we're going to do today. Right, we'll do that today. Um, and so if you have that situation where, okay, we've got two bat chiefs <clears throat> testing and we need one more, okay, we're going to let open it up to captains who meet the, you know, the two year in, in rank criteria, that odd time that it happens, but it shouldn't be, this shouldn't enable people to just skip based on a appointment, which could be political. They still have to test. So it's not like they're there. I mean, I think the appointment. But they will not have right. met the criteria, right. as we pointed out, particularly if they're coming from a much lower rank. Uh, and I can see where, you know, as you pointed out, where you may need an individual in that appointed position for a specific set of um, skills they have, you know. So, y'all's thoughts? <clears throat> Chief Brody, are those positions <coughs> consistent with the duties that each performs throughout, or have they do, do they switch? In other words, from what I remember, there used to be a chief who was kind of equipment, supplies, the, the hard goods. <laughs> then there was the one who got the personnel stuff and all of that. Yes, ma'am. And that was the tested, from what I'm familiar with, and the equipment was the appointed. And I, I can just conceivably see that the personnel guy needs to have been bat chief more than the equipment guy. But I don't know if that's still the way it is or if you have switched. So it is still, still that way, okay. you know. So Chief Fisher handles all of, all of the um, uh, administration and the uh, discipline and the operational side. In my former position, I handled all of the maintenance equipment and purchasing and all of that. Now, at any point, those, those duties can be switched. But let's just say Chief Dunn were to switch Chief Fisher and myself around. I don't become the appointed chief and he becomes right. the just tester. have a new set of duties. Exactly. It's just our job assignments would switch. Okay. And in the event that, <clears throat> so in, in this transition here, I felt that Chief Fisher was more suited for the administrative role, then I could switch his duties to the administrative role and then test for the operational role. I mean, I see that because knowing what a bat chief's job is, a bad chief is going to fully understand what that admin position requires. How does an operation chief know what a battalion chief needs if a, yeah. he was never a battalion yeah. chief? Yeah. Or what he's going through in, in, the, yeah. in the middle of an incident if he's never been one. Yeah. So. Um. So I think with the discussion we've had, I agree with Commissioner Hidalgo that we don't need to make a change. Okay. Sorry, I was not in the microphone. Um, I, I agree with Commissioner Hidalgo. I don't think we need to make this change. I think that we follow the rule as is, two years, four years, unless that gets amended. So Any my motion would be from, uh, to uh, not approve this amendment. Uh, I, yeah, I said that's what we. Uh, or I'll, I'll second this, your motion. Okay. If it was a motion. Is, is that, <laughs> we know what we're saying, but I don't know. Can you write it down exactly what we're trying to say? Just basically, leave we're just going to leave, leave, the, leave, yeah. leave yes. the rule as it is. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, no, no, not approve the amendment. Aye. Aye.
Discussion and consideration on the revising uh, section 48, postponement and cancellation of examinations. Mm -hmm. Yes, so this is one that we discussed at the last meeting. Discussion and consideration of revising civil service rules and regulations section 48, postponement and cancellation of examination to include authorizing the civil service director to act, clarifying action needed when postponement or cancellation occurs, authorizing the chief to change the study material and modifying the notice of source requirement. Currently, Section 48 says the commission may, because of a small number of applicants for any position or because of any other good or sufficient reason, postpone an examination to a later date. Posting of notice for any exam must allow for 10 days notice. Any examination may be canceled by the commission should its holding become unnecessary because of a change in the personnel requirement of the classified service. The recommended revision would be to add um, the commission may, because of the small number of applicants for any position, cancel an examination, which um, has been the practice, or because of any other good and sufficient reason, postpone an examination to a later date. Posting of notice for any exam must allow for 10 days notice. Any examination may be canceled by the commission should its holding become unnecessary because of a change in personnel requirements of the classified service. Number one, the civil service director is authorized to act on behalf of the commission with regard to postponing, canceling, and or scheduling examination. Number two, actually I think if we take this by numbers, um, if you have any recommendation other than what's authorized, I think it'd be easier for us to tackle it that way. Is that okay? I think number one, we discussed at length last time and that that language is good with me. Okay. Um, we did discuss it at length. It's going to depend on how the rest of this develops as to whether that's good or not. Okay. Um, and again, this is the first time we've seen this this language, so I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure at this point if I'm good with one until we go through two through six. There's several, okay. Two, if because any. We had, we talked about how uh, tested candidates could that's subsequently, yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah that's, that's, that's just it. But I, we've been concentrating on item three and now we've moved here and I haven't applied or actually even read what two through six say. Okay, two. If an examination is canceled due to not having the minimum number of applicants for a promotional examination, the examination will be open to those in that position with less than two year service. If there is still an insufficient number of commission, the commission shall extend the examination to members in the next lower position in salary to the position for which the examination is to be held with two years service in that position. And that's the exact language that's in, a, in section 46B in the local rules. Three, absence from attending an examination due to directed quarantine or isolation related to a pandemic will allow for postponement of that examination. Four, any examination, postponement, or cancellation must be reviewed by the commission within 14 days of the examination date at a civil service commission meeting at the request of any disagreeing applicant. Such disagreement must be submitted in writing to the civil service director within 72 hours of the examination date and time. Five, the study material for any canceled examination may be may change at the discretion of the chief. Six, if the study material changes for a particular promotional <coughs> examination due to cancellation, a notice with sources listed must be posted at least 90 days before the date of the examination.
five and six are already in there, as as noted, if I recall. Um, so it really, we're looking at two, three, four. And no, I, I don't think five and six are. I thought that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the ninety-day requirement mm -hmm. when the notice is initially posted, yes, but there, I don't. We don't have a rule that I can remember on if we change the study material that the 90 days maybe I'm just recalling yeah. from our discussion I think it's from our discussion yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think all of these are changes you requested yeah. that we bring back in writing um, is this the first time for everybody in the audience to see these two probably okay could um, I, I speak to the chiefs I okay. think okay uh, could I ask time. that maybe copies of this get made real quick for the, I, I in order to ask any questions you're going to be going back and forth from the screen with three or four I, I just think it'd be easier if they had it in their hand too sure. for questions that we may have could we do that so does everybody need a copy five six seven yes. eight copies yeah 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 I just see the, the union guy He's needing to study, and mm, it, it right. just look at it all on paper. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. This is the one we we talked about for yeah. a long time the last time. And uh, while we're waiting on that, uh, Chief Carter, you and your assistant chiefs are certainly welcome to comment on anything I know so far we've kind of been addressing everything to fire right. but please don't hesitate to approach the podium if you think there's a perspective from the police side of things that we're not taking into account I mean not not that Chief Fincher is like real shy or anything but just with you here you know he, he might not be his normal self so <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we covered all of this last time, and I think this is just them putting it back at us. Yeah, but I think you need to see it in writing, oh, and yeah, and, and I, I would have liked to have seen the actual written language before today. I mean, mm. with our packet. We didn't get and in I'm packet, going to, did we? Huh? No, no it was not in, in the packet, not, and, and I'm going to um, bring that up. Yeah, we just got the yeah. original mm -hmm. as we're yeah. now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because here we go. I know and the changed. minutes from the last time really don't spell these out as clearly as I'm remembering us discussing these. Yeah. I, I mean, like, you're looking at these and this is seeming familiar, but the minutes don't really have our level of detail. It is. Okay. The police. Well, we're gonna talk about that when we get there. The police. 
police went under meet and confer after mm. their probation went to 18 months. And then the police got out of meet and confer. And what they're saying the statute tells us is that we have to go back to 20 months. Yeah, we were talking about that yeah. too. Yeah. So that's why it's like 18 months for fire. And, mm. and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to talk to the chief about what, how that's going to be. Because on our daily action, what we just have the six, seven, eight people who went from probationary to full police, you know, like how much time did they have to observe me? How did it work? You know, typically they give them the typical time period for probation, probationary officer after academy is four months, but it can be less. And I think they can stretch it out if they need to, to six. You know, if there's an injury or but, something. But the, but the statute gives it 12. Right. It, it, according to what Teresa James has told us, mm -hmm. her interpretation is, but I haven't seen <clears throat> anything that backs that up. I'm just remembering so, being a tight squeeze. Yeah. This was several yeah. meetings ago. Yeah, it, it was. It was last summer. It was last July. Mm -hmm. Best friend's daughter is a probationary officer on the street right now. She's graduated in the last academy. She's already gotten bitten by a dog. Well, probably better by a dog than a person. Yeah. Because we have officers who get bit by people. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to laugh because. We don't use SAPD anymore in our cars when we were on the security uh -huh. team. But when we did, uh, one of the officers, Caleb Lawson, um, he showed up one day out there and I think he pretty well. He was limping. I'm like, what happened? He was like, I got yeah. hit. And he had a pretty good shock taken out of his uh, mm -hmm. you know, stitches required. And uh, what made it so funny was he literally had finished the dog bite special class the day before. Wow. And the very next day, he got bit. Got bit. Because I did everything right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, it's a dog. Sorry, the dog didn't go to the, the class. The dog didn't go to the class. <laughs> <laughs> what recourse do you have when the police <coughs> come go somewhere and there is an aggressive dog there? Well, in his case, he actually had to shoot the animal because it would not let go of him. Uh, in my friend's case, she, her partner tased the animal to get it off of her. Really. My understanding. And sometimes the tasing will kill the animal. Yeah, it can. If, if it's small, yeah, particularly the small, small ones. Well, yeah, this wasn't an weight. issue because... It was a big one. Well, uh, Kara is one, weighs one of 105 pounds, and the dog <laughs> was pushing that way. So mm -hmm. it's, but even... I said, y'all should I said, he should have just let y'all Thank you, Veronica. No problem. <laughs> Would it be helpful to discuss each one of these one by one? Um, well, I was kind of 
not saying anything, giving and them a chance to look. Um, and then, and then anybody would like to address any of the revisions? Please do so. I think I think you, this is exactly what we talked about last time, and I think uh, you know as as an association, we like. I mean, I like this. I, I think it gives uh, a civil service director the ability to make decisions and not be hung up, you know, and, and be able to move on with something. But it also, if for any reason, you know, we were unhappy with whatever, you know, a postponement or a cancellation, it gives us a recourse or an appeal type process, uh, and it's only, at that point it's only up to us to create that appeal. So um, I, I think that's awesome. Okay. As far as our as far as our side, I think it's exactly. And I think from the director's standpoint, it, it allows the director to have something to go by and give some, some clarification and some time frames as well. So, um, A point of clarification, on number three, if say you have 10 people signed up for the exam and one of those 10 is not able to attend because of being quarantined and or isolated, um, that still gives the director the authority to postpone that exam. But if I broke my leg on the way to the exam and I'm at the ER, um, this doesn't give you the authority to cancel or postpone the exam. So I'm not sure that the pandemic should allow for one result and the broken leg not the same result, a car accident, and I'm tied up with Chief Carter's guys giving information for an accident report. I mean, it happens. People sign up to take entry exams and don't show up. A lot of that happens. Um, and people sign up for promotional exams and wake up and, or, you know, something happens to some member of the family and they can't come. So I... I think when absence creates a deficit in the number of testers is what we were talking about last time. I think that was the situation that kind of developed that led to your decision to cancel. And my thought was that was what we wanted to address. Not an absence if, I mean, you know, on a lieutenant promotion or a captain promotion, Hopefully, we're going to have more than three, four people sign up so that an absence of one person is not going to defeat the sufficient number of candidates to take the test. So I, I, I like the direction this is going, but I think number three is not quite what I had in my mind last month when we talked about this. Yes, the intent is to justify postponement for only a pandemic when it, only when it drops, us drops below the below, yes, number. The, the required yeah, number. Yeah, and, and we're, we're going to get to that. <laughs> I, yes. I, I know we're still, yeah. But, I mean, that's what I had in mind. Um, Mr. Williams, is that what you had in your mind when you talked about this last? Uh, yes. I mean, I know yes. you addressed this. Yes. Okay. So it wasn't 15 people signed up. 14 no. come. There were four signed up. One of them is out because of quarantine or isolation. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's so, exactly what happened. Yeah, I mean, I Mr. Right. Lopez, no, isn't that what no. you remember yeah, us talking that about? Was, yeah. That was our issue. You know, the rule was you had to have four people yeah. take a test. We had four signed up. And, and God knows I'm not it. advocating word for word transcript minutes. <laughs> Believe me. But I, I do think that that is that what you know, had in mind when we were discussing this, that the, the numbers. So, um, so something to the yeah, effect when of... When absence 
Yeah, when the absent creates a deficit. Creates a deficit. Mm -hmm. right. number of insufficient testers. number of testees. Uh, no, I don't like that word for that Test. situation. Um, te tested, Testers. testing applicants, <laughs> test, applicants. yeah. Okay, Christine, you don't have to put that. <laughs> um, Absence creates a deficit. So adding to the end of that, when absence creates a deficit b below the required minimum. minimum, the required minimum number of examinees, maybe. Yeah, examinees. That, that's word. Better word. Which would be three when we get to it. Well, see, he was talking landlord a minute ago, and I had lessee in my head. <laughs> Just, so absence from attending an examination due to directed quarantine or isolation related to a pandemic will allow for postponement of that examination when absence recreates a deficit below the required minimum number of examinees. Okay. That sounds precisely like what I believe we wanted to me. Okay. That's good. Works for me. Yep. Okay. The only observation I would make on number four is that if cancellation is made under number three it should not be something no. to bring to us if you are below the minimum number of required test takers examinees um, there's nothing there's nothing to bring to the Commission so except as provided in three above and examination postponement and then following the rest of your sentence. I, I, I don't, any examination postponement or cancellation must be reviewed by the commission within 14 days. I, I, I don't think anyone would give you the notice to bring it to us, but this gives them the opportunity, the authority, the right to bring to us a review of your decision made under number three. Mm -hmm. And number three, by its very wording, is canceled in accordance with the requirements set out in law and the rule as it's going to be amended with respect to too few test takers. It, and I guess, it, and I, I have a question. I mean, on, on number four, you know, where it says examination Postponement or cancellation must be reviewed by the commission within 14 days of exam date at a civil service commission meeting at the request of the disagreeing applicant. So such disagreement would be us submitting and writing within 72 hours. So let's say let's let's say it's not a three issue. Let's say right in the actual report it says that for that a, 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 an exam can be for any uh, any other good and sufficient reason be postponed at a later date. So let's say that the director deems that that's hey, this is a good and sufficient reason, so I'm postponing, and we disagree with postponement, could we still just, by the way that's written, just file a disagreement? No, so. or, is yeah. the, or is four only in, in count, is it only talking about three? Does that no, make sense? no. Does that no. four is talking anything, okay. and I'm wanting okay. to accept gotcha. three from it, right. just to make it clear gotcha. that that's not an appealable gotcha. thing. Right. And, and, and I, I think we, we, you know, we like that. Like I said, it gives the director the ability to make a decision and not have to be held up and wait for a meeting. And then if, in, you know, if something on our side, uh, it, you know, someone's upset for some reason, it gives us some recourse uh, to file, you know, within 72 hours. Uh, so, 
Okay, I was just I was just clarifying that it could be it didn't just have to be in relation to three. Uh, right, okay. and right. that's yeah, that's why I was wanting to accept right. three so that it applies to any other cancellation or postponement. So would it, um, if it read any examination postponed except under reason three above? Yeah, or, yeah, any examination postponed or canceled except under. Okay, we can make that change. question on number five and that question would be should we put some kind of like time limit on it um, at some point and, and I know from well I don't know how promotion exams are being crafted purchased contracted whatever these mm -hmm. days at some point whoever is doing the tests has to be told what the study material is so that they know the source material from which they are preparing the test. Mm -hmm. So in my mind that means that's kind of a cutoff for a chief to change the material for an exam. Now this would be the study material for a canceled exam. I, are we going to change the material and not have uh, the test reflect that? I, I'm not sure what exactly. The study material hasn't, I mean, when, when you've I don't know that we've had a canceled exam in Yeah. If in the a long study time. material changes, then After another ninety days has to be given. That's correct. That's my interpretation. So okay. if the study materials does not change okay. so but it, the classification of personnel eligible to sign up for it, another ninety days. Okay. So your question about time for the test prep uh, test writer to have uh, the, Regardless yeah, of what really happens, he would have 90 time done. He has, it's yeah. like, are we... You want to set a time limit on when the, when the chief needs to make a decision whether he's changing materials or not? Uh, not exactly. Okay, because the clock I'm wouldn't start wondering. ticking until those materials okay. were posted. Okay. Um, so, test canceled, rescheduled, new 90 days. That's your opportunity before that notice goes up to change the addition of this book or that book or substitute this book for that book. So, if, so the test is canceled, I would assume we would need to wait that 72 hours for the um, appeal. appeal, no appeal filed. Okay, so now it drops to the next rank, and then at that point, a decision's made whether whether the material be test or changed. If it's three weeks later that that decision is made that the materials test changed, then it's 90 days from that point forward. So whenever those materials are posted, then it's that's when it starts. Well, count. and you know, Chief, the thing is, is that I don't even if the test is canceled, the test is canceled. Whether an appeal is filed in the 72 hours to have us review the cancellation or not, it doesn't really matter what our decision is. Yes, she made a mistake, or no, she didn't make a mistake. 
the test still has to be re rescheduled. I, I mean, the, the 70, she can, uh, it could be posted within that 72 hours, I think, because we can't go back. This, we, we don't have the time machine to go back to that particular day and rehold the test. You know, we can say well, we don't approve have, of what she did, but... You'd have the opportunity to say, no, the test should not have been canceled. It should have been postponed. Now you are to give the same test, and is there to something the about candidates. a 10 day, 10 day period where the test will be given in this 10 day period? Same candidates, same study material. If we may need to spell that out in our rules, but yeah, um, because the the statute just kind of talks about you know whatever and doesn't even set out that. It says you got three rules. Yeah, it it does. It says we make the rules. It also says we can cancel and we can postpone. But how she calls an instantaneous meeting with 72 hours notice, as I pointed out at the last meeting, is impossible. So it's just kind of a, you know, again, the statute was written before the Open Meetings Act was written. Um, did not take that into consideration. And no, no legislature since has taken into consideration that the statute is kind of impossible to follow. Um, Unless you delegate like you're doing this, um, some of that discretion. Yeah, but even, you know, the, de the delegatory authority is kind of supposed. It's mm -hmm. not real specific there. Mm -hmm. um, has, has to kind of be there in order to function. Mm -hmm. um, so. We uphold a cancellation. It's a new 90-day notice. We change a cancellation to a postponement. We're 10 days notice. We uphold a postponement. We're 10 days. But yeah, probably a postponement wouldn't be appealed. Uh, maybe. I, I'm kind of thinking out loud here. Um, I mean, part of me is like, I'm not sure five is needed. If, if it's a canceled exam, it's a new 90-day notice, obviously the, test, the, the material can change. But I don't mind having it there if it's helpful to point to it and say, this says he can change it. Well, you could, I could conceivably see combining five and six. Mm -hmm. They sort of run over the same ground, the way I read it. And so after, after this test, this assistant chief test that just happened, there were captains anticipating the possibility that there was not going to be enough people to make the assistant chief happen. They went and bought the books. They studied the whole 90 days anticipating for that test not to make. That test didn't make. It was canceled and later we changed it to a postponement. But there were people ready just in case and banking on the fact that the fire chief would not change the study material on the second on the second posting. So when it dropped down to the, the rank of captain, we would keep the same material. But I think this gives the ability for the chief to change that material. Because now you've got a captain that's been studying for possibly 180 days, the same material. Now, that, that I mean, we could do that at any time. I could study any test any time, all the time. I'm just okay. saying. Okay, you got me a little confused. Okay. You said we canceled it and then we changed it to a postponement. Well, we well I guess we, we, we brought it to get a, a the test didn't happen. The test didn't happen, and then we brought it here to decide if it was postponed or canceled. We decided it was postponed, and then we held the test. But a cancellation would, would be that not, not, you know, not enough people were there, so we drop it down. And that's kind of why, that's why we came here, was to decide was the test canceled on that day or was it postponed on that day, right? And we ruled, uh, I guess, uh, our last meeting, we decided that it was postponed because we did have enough people well, signed up. I think up. we had an action item to actually make that decision did we no i think we did i think that was the whole point of bringing it to you in the first place to determine whether covid made it a postponement or a cancellation which is why we brought you back the rule for covid so next time it's clearly written that it is a postponement 
Um, so I don't know what was on the agenda, but that was the entirety of the discussion and why we were bringing it to you because we didn't know. Yeah, but I, I we didn't know if we were supposed to add those lower ranks. At the very beginning, that it wasn't on there for action. I don't. Well, have I'd have to look at the meeting. I, I know we talked about it because I remember you saying. I mean, so we've we, got the meeting. You know, you had four people signed right up, here, so clearly we had enough people to, for this test. We, we should have just. Decision, we should have just post, you know, and I and I think that's the deal. Is we just came to get a clarification to get it postponed. And it did, but you know, we, I think y'all decided that last meeting and then he, we've had the test and all as well. But, but in the, you know, I think what this gives the ability to is if, is if we've got a test 90 days and let's just, let's just use the same thing that just happened. One of those people can't show up for whatever reason. There's a cancellation of that exam. You also have a captain knowing or anticipating that could possibly happen has already been studying for 90 days. Now we repost it with or without the same. So he gives the ability for him to change the deal rather than him study for another 90 days the same. Now he's really got two full study periods to possibly be better apt than one of the battalion chiefs that originally signed up. So this gives the ability for him to say, okay, those four people that have been studying, it didn't happen, I'm changing all the books and we're all starting fresh and giving a new test. So I, 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 you know, we, I think that's good, but, or not. If, Okay, no, that item, as I see it, is discussion and guidance, and that's what she said. And yeah, I think the guidance is what we were looking okay, for and how we but, were going to repost that test. Okay, but yeah, yeah. There, there was no actual vote decision. We should talk about it. I'm sorry? sorry? I was telling you, we should talk about it. It was a decision. We went ahead and the test, as it was. I will say I do like the way this current agenda it was set up, the resolve and the consideration uh, being inserted does make clear mm -hmm. what action, that you are requesting action and what action you are requesting, and I, I do appreciate that. Should we take five and six and combine them into? It's almost uh, as, yeah, but you, I think that was your suggestion before. Because it would just well, simply be adding the 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 sentence that's five at the beginning of six, yeah. and it covers it. That's just a thought, just to keep it shorter. But if anybody has Is any heartache with that, that's my motion. Unless somebody has a, a reason to not do that. I second that motion. Okay, I agree. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We'll just combine five or six. Okay. So that does that approve uh, agenda item number four in its entirety? The items with the uh, the corrections we made along the way and combining five and six? Yes. Okay. Okay. Moving over to uh, agenda item five. Discussion of civil service rules and regulations, section 46, promotions, filling vacancies. So we did discuss item five at the last meeting as well. Discussion and consideration of revising civil service rule and regulation section 46 promotions and filling vacancies Subsection e5 to amend the number of participants required to make a promotional examination competitive the current section 
uh, Section 46 indicates to achieve the best possible promotional examination, the department being tested, and the director will coordinate their efforts in the following manner. Four participants are required to make a promotional exam competitive. My recommendation, our recommendation based on the discussion we had last time is to uh, amend that to three participants are required to make a promotional exam competitive. And hopefully that will alleviate having to use the cancellation clause hopefully. or the postponement clause, as it were. Okay. Move to approve. Second. All favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Agenda item six. Here we go. Government Code, uh, Government Code 143. We're looking at probationary period. Okay. Item six. This item's coming to you from, I believe, a July 2021 meeting. I did provide you with the minutes from that meeting. Um, discussion of Local Government Code 143, Section 143027, Probationary Period, Subsection A, and consideration of revising applicable civil service rules and regulations, Section 70, Probationary Period, to modify the probationary period for the police department in accordance with Local Government Code 143, Section 143027. Okay, Veronica, I do not have the minutes from that meeting. I don't know. Okay, I can give you mine. I know Christine took my, the second set of the March 4th, but the July 14th. No, I did not get that. Oh, you're good. I think I'm good. So, um, section 70 of the local rules, Let's see if that's what I'm referring to here. Uh, all original appointments shall be for a probationary period of 18 months of actual service and no appointment shall be deemed final until the appointee has satisfactorily served his probationary period provided that this provision shall not apply to reinstatements made under the provisions of Rule 16 and 17 of these rules. An employee who is on probation may not be prohibited from joining or required to join an employee organization. Joining or not joining an employee organization is not grounds for retention or non-retention of an employee who is serving a probationary period. At this point, based on uh, Local Government Code 143-027, um, we really don't have a recommendation other than to be in compliance with that based on the police department having had uh, a meet and confer agreement um, that is currently not, uh, not active. Um, so our recommendation would be to revise the local rule to have the fire department uh, in line with the 12-month probationary period and keep the, I'm sorry, yeah, yes, uh, the, I'm sorry, the police department with the 12-month probationary period and the fire department with an 18-month probationary period. I have had that discussion with the chiefs, um, and they're welcome to make comments if they'd like. Unfortunately, it's my understanding that can't be changed unless we have meet and confer. Um, each year, it seems like they're extending our academy longer and longer through T-close, so we're talking about a nine-month process just in the academy and four months for riding with a PTO, so essentially they're still riding with a officer. Uh, before they get full protection or not probation. So. so they're going off probation and into full police officer status. 
how long after Academy? How long do you have to watch them on the street before that happens? Four yeah. months. They've probably got a couple couple more months, two, two months, months. Two months. That they're still riding with an officer in the training process and they come on probation. And how long was it when you went through the Academy? I think it was a year. About six. When I went to the Academy. Yeah. Was it, was it about six months that you were roughly still six training? Roughly months yeah. and now it's closer to nine. So. Yeah. Do you think this is another one of those areas where the statutes have not caught up with the, the technology and the training that we're doing with our officers? And because we've had a meet and confer agreement in the police department, the statute doesn't allow us to have the six month extension that it does for fire who's never had one. Well, I know I brought this up last July. I reluctantly bring it up again. Any statutory construction research? that you can present us with. Any grandfathering research you can present. There, I mean, any, the language, any straw we could grab hold? There's of. not. It's very clear that if there's a municipality with a population of less than 1.9 million, which we are, mm -hmm. the rule may extend the probationary period by not more than six months um, for a person who's not employed in a department in which a co collective bargaining agreement or meet and confer agreement currently exists or previously, previously existed. There's nothing okay, in that. I mean, it's a very clear rule. At the time we made it 18 months, mm -hmm. there didn't exist a meet and confer agreement. There had never existed a meet and confer agreement. Right. I'm not sure. So I don't know at what point it, in time we made it. 18 we made months. it in early '06, I believe. It was um, Veronica provided that information. I'll just echo Chief Carter's. January Our recruit academy is 18 months long. So they, they are out of probation by the time they are actually coming onto the floor for us to actually assess their abilities. Now, I think where this rule uh, helps other departments, other cities, is a lot of the cities, those applicants are trained and certified before they come to them. Right. And may, right. Same thing right. may we, be we true. We operate for the police at department. that disadvantage. So we are under a disadvantage. Yeah. We're, we get them, we send them through 18 months of training where other cities, they're already trained yep. and they're ready for their uh, PTO yep. program, FTO program as soon as they hit the ground. And they do have 12 months to assess them or 18 <coughs> months to assess them. We don't have that luxury. Oh. So we have to address it while they're still in the academy, not even doing the job yeah. yet. So, I mean, uh, Teresa, what I remember us discussing last July, you and I in particular, was just, again, the whole concept of Grandfathering. If this, if the rule was legal at the time, it was amended. Then, shouldn't it remain legal? And you said, but the way it's written, it applies to the person, not the department. I remember yeah, that. I believe that was a different answer. argument. No. But in this, it might have been the same one. But in this case, the, I think the distinguishing difference in this statute is it's elective. We did not have to become a civil service city. We chose to do that. We chose to put ourselves in the place of civil service. That no, the voters. It well, was right, put exactly. To the, but it wasn't not, like the statute was just imposed on us like a lot of statutes are, and there's grandfathering that's allowed. We, did, we as a city, our citizens did not have to choose to be under the system of rules. When we did, I, it's my opinion that grandfathering doesn't apply in this case. If there is a process by which you are put into a set of rules, either by your constituents or we choose to follow those rules, then it's not the same as we're operating under a rule and until something changes, that rule stays in place. The thing that changed is our citizens said, you are now going to abide by these rules. And but so that was I in 1940-whatever. It didn't provide for changing it to, I mean, that this is, the statute was amended by the state legislature without any input from the citizens or the council of the city of San Angelo to change the probationary period from 12 months if we so chose. And we so chose. At the time, the legislature amended the statute to let us do it. Then, a couple years, couple legislative sessions later, meet and confer came into being. And there's no correlation made in meet and confer to the impact that 
eventually going out of meet and confer would have on the statute or on the rule that we changed when we changed it. Well, to be clear, we're not out of meet and confer. We are still a meet and confer city. We do not have a contract that's in place right now. Right. So under the meet and confer process that we've agreed to be, again, that was a selection by us, we can still have a contract. We just haven't negotiated one with police at this time. So my interpretation of all of these rules and looking at any kind of um, case law that comes to it is that we, this is all a choice by our community. Meet and confer is the mechanism by which we have to change this to 18 months for police if we want to. Because that is the process that we've entered to that says, if you don't want to follow the rules under 143, the meet and confer contract is the way that you can do different things. Well, meet and confer allows you to do an agreement that deviates from local government code chapter 143, but it also allows you to deviate from what is in your local rules created and promulgated under chapter 143. So it was not put in meet and confer because we were satisfied with the rule that was in place, an 18-month probationary period. When did the legislature make that change? I don't know. Which change are you talking about? Uh, the 18 yes. month? It was... January 26th of 06. Okay, Sorry, that, that's again. when the city made the change. Mm -hmm. In January of 06, and we were not meet and confer in January of 06. Well, that's the reason I ask is because I just, I just queried something. I've looked at some of this before, mm -hmm. but there's a city called Hearst, and in their uh, city regulation that talks about, I'm just going to read it, 1102 extension of probationary period adopted January 21st, 2010, as allowed by section 143.027 of chapter 143 of Texas local government code, the one-year probationary period a person appointed to a beginning position in the fire police department must serve beginning with that person's date of employment as a firefighter police officer or academy trainee may be extended for up to six months for persons who must attend basic training academy necessary for initial certification by t close so apparently there's still some cities that are but they may or may not be meet and confer they may or may not be meet and confer right. and they may or may not allow that to happen before they become employees so a lot of cities do bring you in after you've already been trained as we talked about so there's a lot of deviation you know we did talk to you i know veronica's talked to a number of cities about this particular provision and we're the only meet and confer city who doesn't have a contract an agreement. Agreement. Mm -hmm. so we are kind of in an area all by ourselves we're surrounded by rules that you know bind us one way or another and there's not a lot of good direction on the way that you do that um but this is written very clearly to me that we've been under a meet and confer agreement. If police still has the ability to enter into an agreement, that is how they need to extend the probationary period under this provision. And I understand Teresa's like grandfathering discussions, and we could probably talk about that back and forth a lot, but it's very plainly written in rules that we have agreed that we are going to be part of. Very plainly written where? In the language that I just read to you regarding that if it's a municipality with a population less than a million, you can extend them as long as there isn't which we currently did. a meet and confer agreement or there previously one okay. existed. Which, which we did at the time when there was none. Okay. Okay. So my understanding is we're locked into this. 
we're locked into this change. Yes, that's statutorily based on the fact that we are still a meet and confer city mm -hmm. and we do not have a contract. That would be the way to make the change for PD at this point in time. Okay. <clears throat> I don't think anybody at this table or anybody in this audience thinks that's the way it should be. Right. I think we all think that this needs to be extended, but it needs to be done at a legislative level. Right. And we talked about that, how that takes, I think it was you that talked about how that takes literally years. Right. And just put in perspective to what Chief Carter said, I went to the academy, it was a regional academy in 1985, and our academy was 10 weeks. So it's truly, you know, just, and we can anticipate the future it'll be even longer. Not going to get shorter. No, it won't. But I also, I think it points out, you know, just this is an aside, the additional concern that I have about the way that our civil service rules have come about throughout the years, and there's a lot of duplication of statute, and so when statute changes, it does leave a lot of questions about what the rule actually is that we should follow. Mm -hmm. And so as we're looking at updating and changing, that's some of the stuff that we've talked about we need to bring to you as to how much do we just refer to the statute and how much do we, you know, duplicate that language inside of our, our own rules. is our recommendation. Change as indicated. Okay. You guys agree with this? Did you second? Yes. I'm abstaining. <laughs> I, that's how I've decided to resolve my <laughs> dilemma on this. I am abstaining. Right. <laughs> I, I, I refuse to be a part of <laughs> what I think is a Bad result. Right. So please note my right. abstention. Yeah. <laughs> We're two in favor, so. Okay. That's where we're at. Okay, moving on over to uh, agenda item number seven. We'll just skip to it. This uh, refers to physical requirements and examinations. Yes, uh, agenda item number seven. This is also one we're bringing back from that same July meeting. Uh, discussion of local government code 143, section 143022, physical requirements and examination, subsection B, and consideration of revising applicable civil service rule and regulation, section 111, medical requirements for firefighters and police officers approved at civil service meeting April 4th, 2008 to clarify the time frame of the testing requirements and who the requirements apply to. Um, this is a lengthy one. We did discuss this item at length at the last meeting. Um, since then, I have had a conversation with several cities in regards to... You know, you're talking about July, not our last meeting in March. Yes, I'm sorry, the July, July meeting. Um, in regards to what the statute says, what those cities are actually doing, um, so there, there are not many cities that are following what the statute says. Um, the statute indicates that, uh, and I'll, I'll read it to you, um, 143.022, I should have it memorized by now. Forty-three O twenty-two B. The commission shall require each applicant for a beginning or a promotional position to take an appropriate physical examination. The commission may require each applicant for a beginning position to take a mental examination. I only found two cities that were actually requiring um, an applicant to take a physical examination, but only after they passed a written exam and the physical agility test. Um, nobody was testing or, or putting their applicant that signed up to sit for an examination 
um, at the very beginning, they weren't putting him through a, a medical exam. Um, everybody indicated that, same thing we indicated, that that was cost prohibitive mm -hmm. um, to actually put everybody through that. I think in, in regards to um, what would allow us to follow the statute and um, potentially allow us to put an applicant through that um, and request a, a budget amendment uh, for our department to be able to do that uh, would be to define what a candidate is versus what an applicant is um, and require some prerequisites of our candidates to become applicants after a certain stage and truly allow the uh, mental exam to be for beginning positions, um, but only after they have gone uh, through multiple stages. Um, so as far as the recommendation would be concerned, I can skip over to that. Well, I guess before I go through the recommendations, I, I am going to recommend a few things to that very first paragraph. And I think, Teresa, you discussed at the July meeting, um, the way it's written currently, uh, it places some responsibility on the, the chiefs, chiefs. Yeah. to come up with these medical exams, which um, they're not physicians, neither am I. But um, this, the recommendation will place the responsibility to, to develop... Um, um, some of the, some of these uh, at least functions on the civil service director and then some approvals for the chiefs. Um, so the recommendation is the civil service director will be responsible for developing and maintaining job descriptions that adequately describe the essential functions of each classified position. With the approval of the police chief and the fire chief, physical assessment examinations will be developed and implemented in accordance with the guidelines established by the respective state commissions and in compliance with all applicable employment laws. Prerequisites for consideration of employment applications are successfully passing the written examinations and successfully passing the physical agility if required by the position. Um, the promotional exams don't require a, a physical agility test. If prerequisites are met, candidates are placed on an eligibility list as applicants. Because we discussed, for example, with police, you'll have 100 candidates, 30 will pass, both written and physical, the row, and then the board will say we need 10, and they'll call 20, so there's no sense having medically tested those 20 because they're not going to be considered uh, candidates to the academy. Correct? That's correct. So in, under our recommendation, you have uh, 100 sign up for the test, um, 50 pass the written exam and the physical agility, and 50 will go through the medical examination. You think they should go through the medical examination before I don't think so. they're <laughs> picked to the academy? Because not all 50 are going to be chosen. I don't think they should go through the examination, but based on what the statute says, I don't think there's... But uh, are they truly a candidate if they haven't been accepted into the academy? Well, that's what, that's, <laughs> that's what we've been trying to do is mince those words as much as we can. Yeah. Um, determine when they're actually an applicant. Mm -hmm. And we've hashed around the terms applicant, candidate, I mean, all kinds mm -hmm. of different words we can call them. The reality is it's another bad rule, and it doesn't take into account the realities of picking police or firefighters. So um, I'm, what, however you want to define applicant, but I think that there's some pretty common ways to do that. I mean, I, we kind of looked at it in terms of, like, my position, for instance. I already have to be tested and all of these things that have determined character and qualifications before I can even apply. You can't tell me that when I'm taking the bar exam, that's when I become an applicant for my position at the city. And so we tried to view it the same way for police and fire, that 
while they're testing for a pre-qualification to be part of that certification process, we're not going to count that part. But if you can figure out, tell us, help us find a way to say they're an applicant only after, right before they go into the academy, we're open yeah. to Go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's in 143.022, nowhere in there does it say anything about a medical exam. It says a physical, physical. examination. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know where we're getting medical exam from. Can somebody point that out to me, please? So the third sentence in section B. Appropriate physical examination. The examination shall be administered by a physician, psychiatrist, psychologist, or appropriate as appropriate uh, appointed by the commission. So that allows me, I guess, to um, make the determination that it, it's a, some sort of a medical examination. And I, I get where you're coming from there, but a physical exam to me and a medical exam are two different things. I just want to point that out in my opinion. I agree. Uh, part of it. A couple different things. So just kind of just Googled, and I know this isn't statutory. <laughs> an applicant is a person who applies for something, typically a job. A candidate is a person who is likely to be selected for a certain position of the job. So there's that. It's Google. It is what it is. American Disability Act, U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity, states that you cannot give a, a medical physical exam until somebody has been offered a position. So how can we be giving a physical exam right after a written test or right after a PT test or before any type of selection process has even begun we currently, and it can be echoed over here, we currently do not send them for a medical physical exam until we've offered them a, a contingent job. So well, I, I think, think that, that this stands right in the face of that, but I could be wrong. Um, there's a number of different places that people do that conditional offer of employment. We were talking yesterday, there's also Department of Justice rules related to hiring police officers that mean you should do that earlier in the process versus later, which would just mean more people are being tested. Um, but I agree that there is conflict between these rules and yeah. that process. So with our current application process. But I also process, say that a lot of those federal statutes also have specific provisions, and I haven't looked at that particular one, yeah. um, that relate to certain positions. So if you have a job where it's police or fire, I could anticipate that there might be different requirements for that. I could certainly look at that. But I'm, again, we're happy to like mince this one up as much as possible because there's a lot of conflict. Right, and I'm just looking at our current situation we have now. We started with 39 that set for a test, set for a written exam, and we walked away after physical agility with 18. That's a pretty big call factor. Mm -hmm. Well, after just the personal history statement, we lost 10 of them. So right off the bat, we had 22, no, 32 people that didn't even meet the requirements. And based on reading this at surface level, we would have to provide a physical exam for 22 people that don't even meet the minimum requirements for our job. Same thing with promotion. So when you're talking applying this all to a promotional examination, we may have one position available for the position of engineer and 15 people pass the exam. We know that 15 people will not have the opportunity to promote. There's only one position available. And I know the, the purpose of the examination is to give us a list to select from, but we're not going to pick number 15 <laughs> whenever there is somebody number one as long as they meet the requirements. So when do they become a candidate? Whenever they're reasonably going to be selected for the position? The statute says applicant, though. The statute says applicant. And then that's the problem. Yes. Yeah. Our, our local statute? rules say candidate. Yeah. The local says applicant. Yes. The, 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 the local says candidate. Says candidate. Yeah, I will, I will add that um, 
as far as funding is concerned, depending on when we put an applicant or a candidate through this process, it costs us about five hundred dollars to right. uh, to put them through the entire process. Um, you talk physical and, and mental, or just physical? Um, total five hundred if we do physical and the psychological. The psychological is three hundred on yeah. its own. One of look, the, at uh, that one, look at one forty three oh twenty two. Mm -hmm. um, I'm being nitpick, nitpicky here, but it talks about the physical examination. Mm -hmm. Then it says the commission may require each applicant for mm -hmm. beginning position to take a mental examination, and then it says the examination, but it doesn't refer to which. <laughs> it also does not refer to at what point in the process. Mm hmm. Those then exams. if, you know, I would hate to run, um, I would hate to run counter to the American with Disabilities Act. So take the, the issue of money out of it, which I know it's an issue, but I really don't see the point, I'll reiterate this, as the Chief pointed out, of testing folks that haven't been they haven't sufficiently shown they are going to be able to do the job via, via going into the academy or, you know, going right onto the truck or whatever the, the process is. Um, I think it's a waste of money, a waste of time, and, and it, it does violate federal law. Uh, and unless, unless as you pointed out, Teresa, unless there's some very specific federal, you know, but ADA is pretty straightforward, my understanding. Right. Uh, there's not a lot of wiggle room there. So, you know, wording be what it is, I really mm -hmm. think the spirit of what we need to do with this, however we need to do it, is wait until that that individual is at the point where they're getting ready to enter to, you know, the academy, ready the fire, the uh, police, so on and so forth. That's a good point. Yeah. I'm simply adding the word qualified. I mean, I could apply I, I for the fire department. I think that's what I'm not going to make was it. intended with the if prerequisites are met, candidates are placed on the eligibility list as applicants. Uh, it's a mess on on her. If prerequisites yeah, are met, yeah, yeah that, that's her well, that, recommended language. Yeah, I mean, that, assuming that they're passing, you know, the the written exam, the physical agility. Well, they wouldn't be on the eligibility list if they can't get through the, the very right. basics. Right. I mean, there's there's other qualifications, I would imagine. You know, you're, you're passing a background, you're, which that's the process now. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, based on how the statute's written, it's in conflict with how we're doing it now. Okay, Veronica, in looking at existing, mm -hmm. I see the physical fitness, vision, color blindness, hearing, blood pressure. So, going back to 143.022 from the local government code, the sentence that says the commission may require each applicant for a beginning position to take a mental examination. Do we have in here where we have imposed the mental? Yes, that's a different section currently in the local rules. Let me find okay. that real quick. Okay. Um, it's just currently not in section 111. Okay. 
So, your addition then of the psychological certification language for original appointment, the selected applicant must be in satisfactory psychological and emotional health. Is that going to create a conflict? No. Um, the reason I wanted to add it is just because all the physical requirements are in Section 111 except for the psychological okay. for some reason. What is the rule that has the mental? Let me look for it okay, real quick. Seems like we had an index. Oh, okay, here it is. We do still do psychological evaluations for candidates for PD, correct? Yes, it's, we talked about adding it to fire. It's section 45, content of examination. Uh, 45I. Psychological certification, all applicants for beginning positions shall undergo psychological and emotional health examination by a licensed psychologist or a licensed physician appointed by the commission and paid by the city. We revised this at the last meeting to include the fire department for beginning positions. It's never been in section 111 though for some reason.
are any of when we when we're looking at our applicants and going through and culling them down to who's going to get to the academy is any of that based on either t cole or the commission on fire protection personnel standards or is it simply a local well, there's there's several things that will eliminate a candidate uh, such they will not be eligible for the paramedic if they have any kind of felonies. Okay. And, you know, drug use, that, that's not really, depends on the drug use, if it was any kind of conviction associated with it, mm -hmm. but they'll never be able to get a paramedic license under certain, depending upon what the background looks like. The reason I bring this up, because if you look at... Uh, and I'm sure Tico would be the same. Uh, 143023, sections E and F, E refers to uh, law enforcement and, uh, I'm sorry, D and E. D refers to firefighter and E refers to law enforcement. They essentially say the same thing. An applicant, an applicant may not be certified as eligible for a beginning position with the department unless they meet all the legal requirements necessary to become eligible for future certification by the certifying boards, be it the Commission on Fire Protection or TCO. So that seems like to me um, if they're not eligible anyway, then they're not they're not uh, going to need to be medically tested. That's sort of what I'm driving at. At what point do you, does that do you know that that, that is that that the background? Who does your backgrounds? Chief Fisher, um, does with DPS. Okay. And Chief Carter, when do you do backgrounds on your candidates? Okay, so they do that before same, same oral. For fire, basically, do the before testing, oral, physical, right. and then background. And you still do your backgrounds in house? This gives us, in my interpretation, which I'm not an attorney, but to me this gives us sort of a way through 143.022 because they're not even an eligible applicant until that background check is passed. Which makes the medical... And even for Texas attorneys, you have to pass the background before you're admitted to take the exam. Yeah. Um, and fire and, and police do the same, so it's, it's very both. Really. Mm -hmm. So you think that would be acceptable? Yeah. Maybe we can do some more depth down here, right? So could we add that to one of the prerequisites? Yeah, I guess. That ground. Then they become like eligible. Mm -hmm. What was the word you used in front of applicant? Certified? Eligible. Eligible. eligible yeah, and that's right out of the statute. And they're not certified as eligible unless they have to be eligible. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, 122 was, or 022 was written way before that <laughs> yeah. and only yeah. refers to applicant. Yeah. <laughs> but in their, uh, yeah. in their recommendations, yeah. they're using the word eligible. So we can just add another mm -hmm. thing in there. Another line, yeah. and you can just almost see yeah. the same there. Well, I've also pulled up what does and doesn't. Is it considered medical exams under the ADA? 
current illegal drug use, um, physical agility tests, physical fitness tests, tests that evaluate ability to read or distinguish objects, psychological tests, polygraphs are the ones they list. As eligible? Those are things you can do that are not considered medical. That's strange. They're all medical, really. I know. Say those again. Turn your mic on. So this EEOC document has a list of things that a number of procedures and tests employees may require generally not considered medical examinations include um, tests to determine the current illegal use of drugs, physical agility tests which measure their ability to perform actual or simulated job tasks, and physical fitness tests which measure their performance of physical tasks such as running or lifting as long as they do not include examinations that be, could be considered medical such as heart rate or blood pressure. Tests that evaluate an employee's ability to read labels or distinguish objects as part of a demonstration of the ability to perform actual job functions, psychological tests, and polygraph examinations. Which some of those, like we were just saying, seem kind of medical, but... And then Section F says they must be able to read and write English. <laughs> so... So is your thought adding, passing See why I said we needed work sessions? <laughs> <laughs> adding, um, passing the background uh, as a as third, prerequisite? That's your third thing. Because I think both chiefs would agree and T. Cole and the other agency. If you don't pass the background, then you simply can't move forward. It's not a matter of we want them. They simply can't at that point. You won't be an eligible applicant. And you remain as applicant until hired this board. When it's done, I don't see why it's so critical. Oh, yeah, I think we discussed yesterday the timing is not that important, but at what point you transfer out of being just a guy to being an actual applicant or mm -hmm. a girl to being an actual applicant is the, the point we're trying to mince out here. I mean, I, I think the background is kind of a crucial piece of insertion to make. I just don't know that this section, which is medical requirements for firefighters, is the right place. But maybe that section 45 where we have content of examination and maybe that title we could tweak a little bit. But I mean, this goes through written test, the veteran prep, polygraph, oral, it, uh, let's see, performance test, physical and health test, adaptability and aptitude test, training and experience, psychological. I, I'm not seeing background anywhere, which is weird, but maybe we need to put in the section on background there. And, you know, maybe that's what we need to do with this section is kind of establish the, the steps in the order in which they should be taken to achieve the smoothest process for hiring. And the order already exists. We just need to yeah. make the uh, paperwork match the process. Yeah. I don't think the rule matches <laughs> the process. The process. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I think it would be best if we bring back um, this section and section 45 to include. 
Okay, well, is there anything in your proposed language, the red on what you've given us, that you need, like right now as a temp, until you bring back a more comprehensive whatever? I mean, it's... Yeah, it's like, I don't know that we've actually voted on inserting a psych for fire department. We've talked about it, I know but if done. they're in the hiring process and need that, then we need to at least do a temporary amendment to the medical requirements to put that in until we come back with an overall. Yeah, we Chief Dunn had agreed that that was probably a necessary step. I don't know if that's still the feeling. We voted uh, on that. Did we? Yeah. We did, and okay. it was amended at, in the March meeting. So that, that was what was amended in Section 45. Um, 45I, it actually said the fire department for beginning positions shall undergo. Um, and now it says all applicants for beginning positions shall undergo psychological and emotional health examinations. So that that was done. That's already done. Then. Okay. Yeah. So the purpose of adding it to Section 111 at today's meeting was just because it was related to a health exam. So no, I don't. I don't think there's anything that that needs to be done with this section immediately. Um, we've got. I mean, we're accepting okay, applications. So our action taken on item ten on our agenda from the March meeting. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Suffices to cover. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of looking at those minutes. Yeah. What do you need? It? what the fire department needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, we're taking applications now. We don't have any testing dates set um, for beginning positions, so um, I, I don't think I need anything immediate. To okay. I just wanted to be sure we didn't punch the whole thing if you needed something from us post-haste. Mm -mm. But direction would be good. I think that um, Keith was going down the right road as to how we should be considering drafting this section. I'm still concerned that, I mean, these rules are, they're a scattered bunch of the same rules in different places. And so right. that work group sounds really great. <laughs> I'm sure uh, Teresa's chomping at the bit too. I can just tell she likes that kind of stuff. But. Well, Yes, I wouldn't deny that because if I did, I'd be lying. But I think it's important. I mean, to me, serving on this commission is not just an honor. It is a duty, a duty to perform to my highest and best. And I think that that is a duty that each city council member, each board and commission member, to this city or any other city needs to take very seriously. I think we've had a number of meetings where we've recognized these issues and, you know, I for one am willing to put in the time, effort, and energy to work to achieve a better document. I bet Mr. Williams and some of the people in his group the office on Beauregard would be willing to join us in a work group, and I would welcome their input. It's it's you Mason. Know, I think each chief's office would probably um, uh, draw straws reluctantly, but somebody <laughs> would come and help out. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think, and I'm not talking about having fun and games, although there probably will be things to laugh at as we roll our eyes and whatever, and I talk about, you know, well, and... Chief Carter's dad will remember, we used to call 143-1269-M when it was in the old civil statutes. That's what it was called, and it took a long time to just transfer from one number to the next, 
but we never did anything with the language. And a lot of the rules, I mean, there are a number of places where you see rules have been amended, but there's some of our rules that have almost never been touched from the time they were written. And it's just something that needs to be done. And I don't know how, when, where, um, but I, I just feel like, I, I mean, even today, and I, I really appreciate the, the binders that we got, I appreciate the background information that we got, but the proposed language didn't come until today, and it only came into our hands when I asked for it. It's like, I, I don't want to burden you, I don't want to be difficult, but if the council was handed an agenda and not the background bid information that they were supposed to re review and vote to spend millions of dollars of taxpayer money on, if they didn't get that until the day of the meeting, I don't think they'd like it. If they were told you're going to be voting on an ordinance to prohibit uh, cats roaming free, they must be on a leash like dogs, and they didn't get the ordinance until the day of the meeting, they'd come unglued. That uh, we, need, we need that kind of stuff in advance. I can't look at the, the background material we were given, the current rule and what the local government code says, without having the proposal. I, I, I need what you're proposing so I can put it in the context of that to know what we're doing. And it's like, it, when we do appeals, we get the officer's appeal, whether it's firefighter or police officer, what on the uh, test question that they don't like and why they think the answer is wrong. We get the test question, what the test writer said was the correct answer. We get the test writer's input on why that is supposed to be the right answer. We get the study material, the source material from where the question, we get the whole thing. So we can take the appeal, why the appellant says this is wrong and I should be given credit for my answer and we get all the supporting stuff. And in order to do what needs to be done, this is the kind of thing we need. You know, we need some kind of draft to work up where we can mark up and, and do whatever. But. It's just really important, I think, that um, it, may, it remains a priority with this. I think today was a great start. I think you've got some revisions that have been voted on that can be made to the rules. Uh, the medical one, um, Veronica, the, the HR director that hired you in 2007, you know, first, which is well over 10 years ago, Tad had some changes to make to this, and I still mm -hmm. don't think, you know, they've all been incorporated. Mm -hmm. So this one is a tough one. The, the medical requirements is one of the tougher ones because of the laws that exist now that did not exist when this statute was written, yeah. um, because of the difficulty in taking a position. But I really do think that establishing the order for these things to happen to match the process that is in place, that is used, that works for the departments that need these rules um, is a real important step. Yeah, yeah, and we can talk about the time frame and, and when, when you need those. A lot of that is because I'm working on the language up until days before the meeting, if that's so. Um, and just so you know, internally, I'm trying to have that communication with the chiefs as well um, to get their input to, to make sure that it works for the process also, so, which has not happened in the past, so. Correct. Yeah. But we'll keep working on it and, and definitely provide us your feedback as well to make sure that it's working for you and the information that we're giving you is what you need. We don't want to give you too much also, so if... If you're getting too much and it's confusing, let Christine or I know also. Um, so I don't know if, if uh, you need a vote on that last item, but um, I think based on your comments, we can bring that back along with 
um, section 46 to include what we need to include. I suggest we have you guys review the uh, the background check and then bring this back. That'd be because uh, I really, like I said, my interpretation is we can save ourselves a, a lot of unnecessary testing by eliminating those applicants that are not qualified applicants. Correct. And it's backed up by Texas local government code, just a different section. Yeah, and I think it's well, the same section, local actually. rule 45, not 46, that you were talking yeah. about. 45. Yeah, because 46 is promotions, I think. Yes, and, and 45 actually, we may want to look at promotions, too, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. necessarily in connection with this issue. But possibly. Okay. I think it could be taken care of just with that. So, Small changes here and out. Since it was on our agenda for action, I mean, I think we can either table it and say that we've uh, asked staff to present further work or... Yeah. I think in consideration of, you know, the background check requirements, I think we should table it until that can be put into consideration. And yeah. I think you've got good inputs from both chiefs. So. Okay. Second. Aye. Second. Okay. Aye. 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 At this point, we we'll go ahead and adjourn. So move. Second. <laughs> <laughs> We're all voting for that. <laughs>